Hey guys. I'm Jerry. I'm Sierra. We're ladies. And we tangent. Should we do an intro? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My son does that to me to wake up. What's, What's up, up everyone? everyone? Hello. Hello. Um, there's gonna be like very little foreplay in this one. We're just really getting right into it. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna go in real dry. <laughs> <laughs> just gonna <laughs> Spit is the best lube. I is heard. it? That's what I heard. I don't know. I got some pH shit going on. <laughs> I'm not fully convinced <laughs> that well, I trust anything. <laughs> that was from a uh Jenna Jabez's book. She's a, she was a porn actress yeah i didn't know if you knew her i did i, thought I was being nice because i, I was did. like i don't want to assume that you <laughs> yeah. just know who she is yeah but i do <laughs> i felt like that was a big name well she did a lot of other things as well like write yeah. a book where she said <laughs> that spit is the best <laughs> so i can't oh. say for certain if she's correct yeah hmm okay so <laughs> I don't this we don't normally do part twos so like this is awkward for us because yeah this is coming out a week later but we're recording it right now yeah and so like normally if we are going to record two in a night it's um like a bonus yeah like a totally different topic it's yeah. not an extension of the last one and it's normally like it comes out the same week and not I don't know so like I don't know I feel like I should give you guys something that happened this week but like we haven't well, the Browns lost. <laughs> they did? Yeah. I'm well. wearing a shirt in case you. I don't. I, I'm afraid to put any of these on TikTok because people I'm sure will be mean about it. You, I don't think anyone is can be as mean about the Browns as the Browns are. <laughs> <laughs> like, They're actually pretty good. Are they? But they did lose. But they were playing like the team that was in the Super Bowl last year. So, Kansas I mean, City Chiefs? That's it. How did you know? Because our parents are there. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> our dads are there right now. Yeah, they were probably upset because it actually looked like they were going to win up until halftime. Yeah? Yeah. I don't care about sports. I'm trying to. I know because your fiance loves. And truly, I, when I thought it was just them throwing a ball back and forth, I was like, fucking boring. boring. But like now that I know the rules and strategies and stuff like that, I actually like it a lot more. Oh, my God. I don't. Plays and stuff. It's very football is so confusing to me. It was all I know is and blue 42 hat hike, <laughs> but I don't know if blue 42 is like what they always yell. Yeah. Or if like <laughs> there's other numbers and colors. I have, I can tell you that much. <laughs> I just know that I just like seeing plays and stuff. Yeah. It's, it is, it is interesting. The more you learn like about a it. spread. Yeah. I love a good spread <laughs> and we're back on the loop. <laughs> I was thinking mayonnaise, oh. which is why my pH is messed up. <laughs> you know what's better than spit? Oh, mayo. <laughs> Yogurt. Uh, it's yeah. supposed to help. Well, that's with... Because it's got live cultures. I don't know. I was doing a lot of Googling today. <laughs> You're like, what's up with my vagine? <laughs> why do I smell like Lake Erie? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like... You should probably talk to somebody about you that. You should see a doctor. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> you mean I can't just like wait? <laughs> That's what I like to do. Until it gets too. real bad and then I'm like, oh, Well, no. I did that <laughs> until it said it. it clears up in two to three days. But if it lasts longer, you should see someone. I'm like, so two weeks is too long? <laughs> <laughs> well, fuck. Okay. <laughs> so. Ugh. What if, what if, what if <laughs> this is very, we thought talking about our abusive relationships were vulnerable. <laughs> now I'm telling you about my pH. <laughs> what if you were in the lake, like something got in there? That's my concern. That's that, what because that's about. when it started. Oh my God. I know. I, lake Lakes Michigan. fucking freak me out. Was it Lake Michigan? I will go in an ocean. Or was I in Lake Erie? I think it was Lake Erie. I'll go in an ocean before I go in a lake. <sighs> The salt probably helps. <laughs> that, and I feel like there's a lot of motion, so nothing's around for too long. There's, oh. You know? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> anyway. Although, have you ever, when you were younger, did you ever sit in the sand? So this time, when we went to the beach, I sat with Noah, because he was playing in the sand, uh -huh. while the waves come, and then they drag you, and then you stand up, and your fucking suit you is have a, full. a diaper <laughs> full of diaper. sand? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, well, that looks even funnier on a pregnant woman. <laughs> I don't doubt it. <laughs> I was like, what's up? Did I shit myself? <laughs> nope, it's just it. Then you got to go in the water and kind of floop, floop, floop. Oh, yes. Do you ever fl- flop yeah. it out? Do you ever flip floop in the ocean with your sand butt? <laughs> Except that I couldn't get it to turn, so I just took them off. But then the oh. wave sucked back in my ass. <laughs> <laughs> that happens to the best of us, like, doesn't oh, it? No. I have shit in a lake before, though, so I think Me that's too. karma. <laughs> Me too. It's like you shit in our lake. We <laughs> have fucked up <laughs> your shit. <laughs> yeah. That's no boy no. So you will remember us. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, did you. Two yes, weeks later. <laughs> still. Very, very, very real present problem in my life. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. I know. What are you going to do? You know what? That We're we're normalizing this stuff. We, and you should. Am I going to regret this later? Definitely. Guess what? <laughs> Guess what's happening I'm with gonna my... I'm going to be embarrassed and thinking about it all night long, but... Guess what's going on with my downstairs? I'm just like... Don't know because you can't see? Well, first of all, yes. And second of all, I'm just like pissing <laughs> <laughs> all the time. Yeah. But like slow leaking pee. Yeah. Like in my bed. Mm. <laughs> so that's been a problem. That's been a problem. That's, especially because... <laughs> that's not my fault. That's not my fault. <laughs> It's your baby in there going, that's, that's my fault. My, hey, that's <laughs> my fault. I am on your fucking bladder. Yeah. I keep thinking my water breaks and then I smell it. And I'm like, tight, asparagus. <laughs> mm. I would kill to smell like asparagus right now. <laughs> Instead, what, it's like, which oh, one? sushi. <laughs> <laughs> which one is worse? Yours or the fact that I'm always pissing myself? I don't know. I feel like. Because I feel like mine is going to continue into, for the next five weeks and yours might go away in two or three days. <laughs> Not unless I go see someone. It's already not gone away in two to three days. Oh, my God. Anyway, okay. So Trauma bonding. There, we gave you a little bit of <laughs> yogurt. <laughs> and now that the men aren't listening, <laughs> let's talk trauma bonding. So the last time where we left off, we were talking about the seven stages. If you are a man and you're still listening, we love you. You're the oh, real ones. I do love you. And I don't mean it when I say like all men, but like, yeah. you know, you, if you you're know. listening, you know what not all men means. <laughs> yeah. You are the not all men that we, <laughs> we mean. Yeah. So the last thing I said was that um, in the in stage of addiction, that the <laughs> dependency. <laughs> Sorry. Love. Yeah. Fuck that you. <laughs> Just take them off. Well, I have an ingrown uh, toenail as well that I picked today, and it's been hurting. And so, you know what? I'm just feeling very <laughs> what's the exposed and vulnerable and insecure. What's the science behind ingrown toenails? I don't know. I pick my toes because if there's just the slightest bit of a little hook and on it and uh-huh. it snags, I have to just like dig at my feet because God forbid I get up and find where the toenail <laughs> clippers are <laughs> and I don't ever do it correctly. Anyway, sorry. Get back to what you were saying. Okay, no, but that made me kind of <laughs> nauseous. Sorry. Toenails freak me out. Um, any kind of nail bending? Mm. The last nail bender. <laughs> the- <laughs> that was a good one. Okay. Okay, so the last thing that I said was that addiction comes from understanding the core dynamics of how we humans react to the combination of dependency and abuse coupled with something called intermittent reinforcement. So let's talk about intermittent reinforcement. Yeah, if you didn't l- listen, last week we covered the seven stages of trauma bonding. Yeah, so please this go is, listen. This is, a, this this is, part, is part two. two. <laughs> um, so intermittent reinforcement, there was a study that was carried out that talked about this and it used lab rats and pellets of food so first of all lab rats like when people they're they're very similar to us even though their brains are teeny tiny they're super fucking smart and so that's why they're used a lot in things like this so this is how they would reward them okay so the first thing they did was pattern number one they would reward the rats every time the rats press the bar yep So this was the least effective because as soon as the reward stopped, the rat was like, fuck this. I'm not pressing the bar anymore. And so they didn't press it anymore. Um, They might do it one or two more times, but basically they would all leave it alone. Pattern number two, the rats would get rewarded for every 10th press on the bar. Um, And this got, they would hit it a couple times. And then once they finally got their food, um, they would realize like they started realizing it was every 10 times uh-huh. 
And so um, most rats tried at least one more round of bars and did another set of 10. But then basically it didn't take too long for all the rats to realize that there would be no more food rewards for their efforts uh, unless they hit the 10. So they just stopped working and looked for food in other places. Yes. They were like, I'm not fucking going. This is too much work for yep. me, basically. Pattern number three, the food would, would be rewarded every 10 minutes. So the rats learned that they would only get these food pellets on a set time schedule. And then once they they started getting really frugal with their presses because they knew that it was on a timed schedule. So mm. they would just press it a couple times yeah, so closer like what's the to point the 10 of, minutes. Yep. Um, after the reward completely stopped, it only took a few non-rewarded 10 minute rats, 10 minutes for the rats to stop expecting the food and move on. Pattern four was intermittent reinforcement. So this is a pattern where the researchers finally outwitted the rats. They, there was no predict. <laughs> Sorry, it's so funny to think of all of these scientists, <laughs> these brilliant like minds funny. in a room, and they're like, I'm going to fucking outsmart these rats, I swear to God. The rats are like, uh. <laughs> just picture like <laughs> fat uh. rats laying on their back, like, give me the fuck food. Fuck your pellets. Ten- <laughs> He's checking his watch. He's like, it's been 10 minutes. Give me the fucking pellets. Yeah. Um, so they would randomize the time between rewards and move the goalpost as to how many bar presses would be needed for the food pellets in exchange for the pressing the bar. You know what makes me feel yucky is we learned about that in school as a way to change behaviors mm. for students. <gasps> Ew, manipulation. It is. It is. But it's all. Uh, it yeah. is. But it is it's, good to keep kids going. The reason. Keep their it was not the first one. It would be when we were trying to introduce a behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes it was a positive behavior yeah. for kids on the autism spectrum. Sure. Um, or kids who were trying to learn how to manage their own be- like ADHD behaviors and things like that. Mm-hmm. It was helpful to um, do a behaviorist kind of thing where you would uh, reward them every single time and then you would reward them every 10 minutes or 15 minutes and then you would reward them randomly before stopping the rewards at all because uh, the hope eventually would be just like that that they they, would want to do it they would want to do it and they would uh, already have the pattern Mm -hmm. um consistently so yes well in that way i'm sure it could be used in a positive way yeah um but, but when used for negative things. Right. So, much like the rats in the study, victims will continue to try and please their abusers in the hope that this will be recognized and will be rewarded with their love. And much like the researchers in the study, the abusers know that randomizing when they give their attention and moving their goalposts will make you strive harder for those little breadcrumbs cr- of affection. Mm-hmm. So the more that they move it, the less they give you, the more you try to please. Yep. And eventually they will give it to you, but it's very sporadic and very randomly. Um, not only that, but you won't give up or lose interest because intermittent reinforcement leaves me, leaves you hoping that the next reward is just around the corner, even if you know it isn't. Yeah. So. Pause. Before you read more, will you yeah. remind everyone of what book we are pulling oh, information from? Sure. So this is called Trauma Bonding. The author is Lauren Kozlowski. And um, yeah, Sears so a- just highlighted some pieces of it yes please go and get the book yourself there's so you can so much more in it there's like this part i'm not going to talk about it at all but it's a look at stockholm syndrome and its parallels to trauma bonding there's a look at cognitive dissonance with par- or trauma bonding i'm not yeah we just don't have enough time but yeah and I and, wanted you know to we the don't really want important parts we want this author to make her money you Absolutely. Know? so yeah, like please go and yeah get these if because those parts are really really good as well and yeah. especially the stockholm syndrome i mean you can draw a little bit of parallels but it makes so much sense when there's something that has a fucking name to it mm-hmm. that like when you say Sorry. <laughs> when you say someone who was kidnapped is like loves their kidnapper and people accept that because they're like Stockholm syndrome, that makes sense. But you can't understand how a victim loves their abuser. Right. It really helps to draw that parallel where yep. it's it's like it is kind of the same thing. I mean, it's using the same science on a chemical level inside yep. of your brain. So and it's helpful to know that it's on a chemical level as well yes. because it makes you feel like it's not something you can control it because isn't. I think that's something that we think we can do is mm-hmm. stop loving this person mm-hmm. even if you know it's wrong to be there you feel like you can control it and if you were strong enough or smart enough or brave enough like that you would you 
are able to stop feeling these emotions and wanting to stay yes. um, or caring for this person, but it's, it's biological. Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. So what I am going to talk about is the five stages of now accepting that you're in a trauma bond. This is a hard because a lot of times, sorry, you went. This is a hard. This is a hard. hard. This, this is a hard. Well, I was gonna say, this and it's is not a, your fault. This is hard stage, but I was like, it's five stages. So <laughs> yeah. This is a hard five stage. <laughs> um, it's it's a really hard thing to do because you don't want to accept it. Like mm-hmm. for the longest time, I didn't want to accept that I was being abused. Yep. I didn't want that. You didn't want that label. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's because you had pre me as well, had previously looked at other people, other relationships and thought that could never happen to me. Yep, not I'm me. not that whatever. I'm not going to make excuses to mm-hmm. say with someone who treats me like garbage. I see all the time when people post like, hey, I need help, blah, blah, blah. And people are like, dump him, sis. Okay, I love that, but like, not that simple. Yeah. And when so many people say that to you and make it seem like make it's it seem easy, easy, yeah, like just fucking leave, duh. Yeah. Then you're like, now I want to do this even yes. less. Well, now I have to pretend like I'm not because I like I'm not being abused because I didn't just fucking dump him. Right. And I've I've talked to someone before about how like on paper with difficult things to other people, it looks like a straight path A to B. And yep. so it seems like there's one simple solution. Here it is. Yep. Go on this path right here. Mm-hmm. You get straight from your problem to your solution. But that's not normally how it is. Normally you have it's nor you're starting at one yep and maybe 10 is the goal mm-hmm. and you have to bounce two three four five six seven eight nine all over the map there's so many hoops and hurdles that you have to jump through yep. to get to this the goal and at you're the probably end. gonna go back to a several right? times and so it's not as easy as going from point a to point b there's yeah. so many stops along the way and there's so many moving pieces that you have to understand mm-hmm. or prep for and it's it's someone in not in your situation isn't aware of all of the things standing in your way yes So the only way to free ourselves from the clutches of an abusive relationship is to take all the energy that's being wasted on the abuser and focus it back on ourselves. That sounds easy, but it is not, especially when you've been broken down as much as they break you down. But to free yourself is to find the strength to take your focus off trying to fix them, appease them, pacify or change them and change yourself instead. Right. Because um, you definitely have more control over that. You do. And and they're it, going to make you feel bad for it. That's the thing. Yep. That's what they want to do because you can't take the attention off them because mm-hmm. then you'll know. Like when I started working on myself, when I, I remember saying that I was going to therapy and it, he was like, so like, why are you going to therapy? It was yeah. like, a, oh, that's dumb. Like, obviously, stigma on therapy. Yep. But it made me feel like, again, that I was crazy. Like oh, he was like, well, don't let people know that you're in therapy, blah, 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 whatever. Um. And now I know it's just because he knew if I was talking to somebody about what was going on, they would be like, hey, red flag, sister. Yep. That is not, you got to get out of there. And that's exactly what happened. And he knew it, but he, it, that was also his stipulation multiple times if we got back together was that he had to go to therapy and he would go one or two times and then be like, yeah, that wasn't for me. Yeah. She said that I'm good. She said I'm fine, which no, they fucking didn't. Yeah. And if they did, all you did was sit there and lie the whole time. I know you didn't actually try because then you would have to admit that you are the problem. And even if you were fine, no therapist is going to say you're fine. Don't come back because people who don't identify with having a mental health disorder still severely benefit from going to therapy. And like they might make it like, hey, you don't have to come every week now. You can come every two weeks or every month. But which happened to me. And now Barbara's like, (laughs) me. (laughs) Me thinks maybe (laughs) we should go back to bi-weekly or weekly. Yeah. I don't play where. She's like, remember when I said uh, you would relapse? We're there. Yeah. And that's that's true therapy. Like you're never going to get to your end goal. Yep. And that's that's an okay thing. Like growth shouldn't be something that you get to the end to right the end of um once you can start working on your self-esteem you'll begin to realize that you deserve better that's where i started to get i was like i don't fucking deserve this i was me by the way and then when you're working on yourself like that the people that you've lost either you'll meet new people 
um, or those people will come back to you. Like they'll know that you are working on yourself. Like I, people came back to me when mm-hmm. they saw that I was becoming myself again. Well, and you allowed yourself to open your, up to them again. Yes. Yeah. I knew that you they made yourself available to I those people again. They weren't my enemies anymore. Right. Um, leaving an abusive relationship is one of the hardest things you will ever do in your entire life. This she writes, I left and returned to my ex multiple times, even after the abuse only ever escalated and it got viler each time. So, again, I would like to say average is seven times leaving. It is not unheard of if you go back. I don't want to say that I it's understandable because I, I hope for your sake that you don't. But I get it if you do. It was almost impossible for me to get out. And literally all the stars had to align perfectly for me to finally fucking be able to do it. And even then, that first year was so incredibly hard. Yeah. So hard. Um, she says, uh, once the bruises fade, the relationship doesn't seem so bad after all. They feel very much like I did for so many years that perhaps they had overreacted to what had happened to them. They feel immense guilt for abandoning their abuser when they need them the most. Mm-hmm. Meaning when the abuser needs them. Yep. Which is crazy because I felt like I he needed me. I needed to be there. Also, yeah. I was getting multiple messages of him um, with guns on his lap saying, like, yep. I'm threatening, uh, threatening to kill himself. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew that it wasn't my fault, but at the back of my mind, I was like, if he does this, this will be on me. Yep. His family will blame me for it. Everyone in the world will blame me for this. Yep. And it was terrifying. It made mm-hmm. me multiple times think, even though I was so happy, that like I have to go back. I have to save him. That's a manipulation tactic, it by is. the way. Like that, my ex did that as well. Yes. Um, it was, you're going to have to explain this to my mom in the morning yes. when I do this. Um, the time where I mentioned in the last episode that the police were called in the dorm room, um, he wasn't letting me out of the room. Mm-hmm. And finally, he said one person could come and talk to me through the door. And then when um, the police showed up and I explained to him, like, you can't, like, you will go to jail. Yeah you need to let me out of this room. Mm -hmm. Um, He finally let me out Mm -hmm. and he just was texting me over and over and over again. Um, They tried to kick him off campus, but he was drunk and he didn't know anyone else other than me. And so I said I would stay somewhere else Mm -hmm. and just let him have my room. Um, I did that with my house. That's mm -hmm. why I stayed there. He wasn't on my lease. That was my home. Yeah. when the cops came, which, by the way, I didn't press charges because we talked about them in the first episode and it's OK, whatever. But the cops were like, where should I take him? And I was like, he doesn't have anywhere to go. Just take him back to my house. I'll stay here. Yeah, I'll stay somewhere else. Did he you stay just, somewhere else? Yeah. Uh, well, one night. And then yep. I went back. I That same night, he was texting me, apologizing same. over and over and over again. And please come back. Please come mm-hmm. back. And so I did. I, I was with my friends down the hallway. Mm-hmm. I was going to stay in someone else's room. But then I looked at them. I'm like, guys, it's OK. Like, I overreacted. I caused this. Yes. I'm. It was my fault. And so I walked back. And he had like scissors on the floor and he was like, I was going to use these Mm -hmm. and I didn't want you to be the one to find me. And I'm like, but it looks like you did. It looks like you did want me to find it. It looks like this was your intent the entire time. He set up literally everything so that I would find it like this. He tried to go out the window. Oh my goodness. So like it was his plan, but he never, he never actually I don't want to say that he didn't want to do it because I don't want to speak on someone else. Like, I don't want to say that if someone says it, that they don't mean it. Right. But he was using it as a manipulation Absolutely. tactic. Absolutely. And um, I felt responsible yep. I, for his well being. And I also knew, and I know this is true for you as well, that he had terrible things happen to him Mm -hmm. as a child and he had um, a not great upbringing. And even as like a young adult, he had terrible things happen to him. And I made excuses saying he just doesn't know what real love looks like. He doesn't know right from wrong. Because of everything that happened to him in his childhood, he didn't deserve that. And now he's, I just need to fix, if I I could show him him Mm -hmm. and show him what real love is, then he'll be the person that I met in the beginning. Mm Mm-hmm. Which was never going to happen. Because the person you met in the beginning wasn't, wasn't real. real. That wasn't who he was. That's the hardest thing to learn. It is, is. that per- The person who you think is not the real them is the real them. And the, per- the person they got you with yes. was a character they created. Which again, it's hard because he kept showing those that person... 
But it was only after that love bombing version of himself was only after he did horrible, horrible things. But he was such a good person to me in mm -hmm. those moments. But I have to remember they were after he did the worst shit that anyone's ever done right. to me in my life. In my life, he broke me as a person. Yeah. And then I feel bad because he, I don't know, took me to see the sunset a couple times. Or you know what I mean? Hey, the sun sets every fucking day. <laughs> yeah. Okay? I've seen he didn't make times. it. No, he didn't. He didn't put the sun in the sky and bring it back down for you. Yes. Okay. It does that naturally. <laughs> I know. There's so many things that he did, though, that I was like, oh, remember he did that? That's such a nice thing. And now here I am talking shit. And I'm like, no, remember when he broke your face on multiple <laughs> occasions? Yes. Let's just keep remembering yeah. that. Yeah. Because that was who he really was. Right. Okay. Victims who go on to become survivors of an abusive relationship progr progress through a process of five stages before they finally break free from the restraints of their toxic relationship. The first stage. Um, the first stages are when they're still in the relationship. So stage one is denial. Yeah. Um, this is where they deny or minimize the abuse that they've endured, despite everyone be around being able to see what's going on. And that's the thing. A lot of times it'll get to a point where like literally everybody else is like, are you fucking serious? Yeah. We all know that this is happening and you will still... That is what I'm most ashamed of. But at the same time, now that I know that it's like a fucking scientific thing. Yeah. Like, it doesn't make me feel so bad. But I'm so embarrassed that I was just like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Like, especially to Noah's Cause you other think that, parents. Yeah. I feel like embarrassed that they are looking at me as like, yeah, again, a bad parent because I stuck up for him so much. And I know that they were just trying to protect my son, who, mm -hmm. again, was never in harm's way. All the abuse was directed at me yeah but um i feel stupid now it's like telling them like yeah he was abusive because they're like well fucking yeah we said it a lot yeah but at the same time well because in that moment you still want to believe that you you were in control yeah that you had the power and that if it was bad yeah. you would get out and that you could see it yep. like you don't want to admit when you're in the moment yeah. that you're in as deep as you are yeah and that you're not as strong to get away or not as right. smart, quote unquote, right. to see what's going on. But um, in reality, we are simply denying what's happening and trying to minimize the toxic influence that it has on us. And during this stage, um, which most people stay in for the longest amount of time, by the way, you feel trapped and utterly hopeless to improve things. You make ge no genuine attempts to take actions to make your lives safer or less threatening. And instead of viewing your abuser as a nasty, abusing, abusive, soul-crushing individual that they are, you prefer to see them as the person that you first met. Which I'm still fucking doing, like mm -hmm. I just said. The person who love-bombed you and made you feel so wanted and special. The good times, the honeymoon stage after every incident of abuse. God, she's like writing this. Just This is her quotes, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's nice to know that um, someone else... I think that's why so many of you connect with the podcast in general is because we say the things that you have said to yourself in your head. Yeah, but it's like nice to hear other people. It's, it's like, nice oh my to hear god. it out loud and not from your own voice yes. because you're like, oh my god, that I'm not the only person who thought that. Then I'm not that's the only real. Yes. That's true mm -hmm. because it's not just me. Yep. Um, she said ever after every incident of abuse, that's what you prefer to associate with the abuser, not their nasty true self. Which again. Right. That is the true version of them is the version that if someone truly loves you, I am, you guys say this all the time when you like listen to the gaslighting one, I've had multiple people personally message me and be like, thank you for telling your story. Um, I'm in an abusive relationship right now. I'm trying to get out of it or I just got out of it and you make me feel like it's possible to be happy again. When I, again, I said when I first met Corey, I was like, this is not what love is supposed to be like. Yeah. And it was very rocky in the beginning, mostly because I was the toxic one, because I had so much left over from this. But when I saw his true self, I remember for probably the first two years waiting for him to show his, that other side. I'm like, yeah, every time he would get drunk, I would wait. When's it going to show? When's yeah. it going to show? Well, this you were still you in are. a way in survival mode. Yes. You, Corey had to work hard harder yes and i think in a way that's why we appreciate men or uh, i'm sure other you guys have other partners who you can associate this with right. but 
for us. Like Corey and like Shane, because they had to work so much harder yeah. and and vice versa because Shane was in an abusive relationship mm-hmm. um before and so I had to work yeah hard to show him that I'm not going to what actual love looks yes. like because mm-hmm. for me I was thinking like love was what I the love was the love bombing yeah and then when I met Corey and I realized that like all the things that my previous ex had done to me you don't do those things to the person that you love. Corey has never done that. And we've gotten into fights. Yeah. But never put his hands on me. Never, like, intentionally gaslit me. There yeah. are times sometimes when, we, when we're yeah. drinking that, like, it happens on accident. Um, but he doesn't do it intentionally. And he apologizes. I call right. him out on it and he apologizes immediately and feels well, terrible. We've talked about with fallacies and cognitive dissonance that like our brain automatically does these things. And I think uh, gaslighting, yeah. like, like I know that I've done it. Me like too. I've talked about it with Shane and he's like, how is it when I do something, it's this, but you're doing it to me now. And I'm like, shit, you right. Huh? I know. Fuck. Yes. <laughs> okay. I see it. But like, because we're, we are in a safe, healthy relationship, yeah. we can have those conversations yes. where we can say what you're saying right now is not okay. Yes. And here's why mm-hmm. let's, you can get your point across in a different way. Let's, let's focus on that instead yeah. of like this. And when I was with my ex, it always felt like it had to be me versus him. Yep. Like I got to win this fight. And the other night, we, not the other night, uh, weeks ago, um, we got into a pretty bad fight. Not terrible, but just like, yeah, we don't fight hardly ever. So when we do, I'm like, it was pretty bad. But really, it was just yeah, like comparatively our voices were raised. <laughs> yeah. Um, for like five minutes. And I don't think you need to defend having a fight because it's so normal. It's normal in a relationship. But when you've, when you have the trauma of being in a toxic relationship, Mm -hmm. you feel like you have have to to defend defend your partner. He's got to be perfect all the time because fights previously meant something very different. Yes. So during that, I remember the one thing he said, he was like, it's just you and me in this game. It's just, it's us versus this, not you versus me. And I was like, fuck man that is the difference that is the difference Mm -hmm. is that it's not me and you we're fighting against each other right now but that we don't need to be there's no reason to be and like the fact that he could communicate and we could have that talk because he was being a drunk asshole sure (laughs) i was being very hormonal (laughs) because i'm pregnant both of us were in the wrong with the and so when we could get to the point where we were both like you know what you're right. When you said that thing, I fucking am sorry for that. And yeah. I was like, you know what? And I was I was kind of overreacting. Yeah. And I'm sorry. I don't like that you're having fun without me. <laughs> and that's a me problem. Because <laughs> you should be allowed to still have fun. Anyways, I just wanted to say that you can get to a point where you'll feel love, real love, but it's not going to feel like what this is. Yes. And it's I different. Want, I want you to... Because this isn't love. I want... That's exactly it. And I want people to know that like that's possible, but they have to be open to that because mm-hmm. I almost shut it down. Yep. Same. Shane full out dumped me twice. Yeah. <laughs> and I yeah. was like, hey. Well, there have been moments. I think we're supposed to make out forever. <laughs> I remember in like our first two fights with Corey that I left dramatically mm-hmm. and was like, I'm staying at my mom's because that's what I used to do before because I was searching for that love bombing. Yep. I wanted that. Chase me. Chase buy me. Buy me things. Go over the top. And he said to me when I came back, which he did not come chase me. Yeah. He was like, either come home or I'm. <laughs> you walk in the door like, hey, <laughs> don't you know what we're doing? So that's why you never know, played this game before. I walked in and then I started a fight. And then he <laughs> oh, walked... I got to do this bigger. Is that what it is? <laughs> so then he walked downstairs and he said, you're being very toxic right now. And then he left the room. And I was like, no, we're going to continue <laughs> this. So I walk, I like chased him down there and he was just sitting on the couch in the dark, like silently and yeah. not crying or like, do, but just, I could tell he was sad. And he was like, Sierra, I love you, but what you're doing right now is not okay. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to continue doing this. If you think that the way you acted tonight is a normal way to act in a relationship, then I don't want to do this anymore. And I was like, Damn. I thought I was the older one. <laughs> he was like, you cannot just leave me and not say anything. You just left. I didn't know where you went. And I didn't even know where you're fighting. <laughs> Which he didn't. He said like, and you're like hold on, I'm going to get naked real fast because your emotional maturity is high <laughs> as hell. No. And so it was just like, 
I, I just am trying to tell these stories because I want people to know that this is possible, but you are going transitioning. to be, you're going to be the problem sometimes and that's yes. okay. But, it, but you have to be able to spot when it's happening because mm-hmm. a lot of people take these toxic things that they feel and bring them into new relationships and it starts to cycle all over again. Well, and I think that's why I like to mention that, um, my abuser isn't an ab- <laughs> he might be i don't know who he is anymore but doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be everyone's abuser sure. you know what i mean yep. and so like i n- would never want to paint him as a horrible person yeah we were horrible together right um and so like yes my experience is a very real very terrible experience but i and same with Shane and his ex. Like I would, I would venture to say that Shane's ex mm-hmm. probably believes that Shane was yep. a, a horrible person in her life, right? And vice versa. Yeah. But do I? And I said this to him yesterday. I was like, Do I think that she's probably a very kind person and has a healthy relationship and is people who love her and she loves them? Absolutely. Right. You guys were just not good together. Mm-hmm. But he and I together are wonderful. Right. Not a toxic bone in our bodies. Right. Well. Maybe sometimes we'll get there and then we have to put each other in check. Well, but like, gonna say, but it's growing together. Yes. Like, like I said, me and Corey, that moment. We're healing. We're yes. healing. And so it that is. That moment that he gave me that, like, it was almost like he held up a mirror and I was like, ooh, I do not yes. like what I see. Mm-hmm. But thank you for showing me. Yeah. Because I don't want to be that person. I remember that was a tactic my ex used on me. As a manipulation tactic, he would just leave on nights that he knew I had my son and couldn't get in the car and chase him. Yep. And he would be gone for hours, sometimes days, mm-hmm. shut his phone off so that I couldn't. And it was horrific because I was like, I need you. Mm-hmm. You don't understand. I fucking need you. And now I feel like it's my fault. And and now you're gone and I don't know where you're at and who, you, who you're with and all these things. And it's like, I tried to do that to Corey and like. He reacted in a normal way, yeah. which was, hey, I didn't like the way that that made me feel. And if you do that again, I, we can't do this because you're trying to manipulate me right now yep. with you in a reaction. And I'm not going to react the way you want because you're playing a game right now and I'm an adult and we don't do that. And yep. I was like, fuck. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Um, OK, so she says this is a quote at this point in the denial stage. The fear of losing my partner made me feel like I just loved him too much to leave. I wasn't yet aware that I was trauma bonded. However, during stage one, we are still in a state of absolute denial. And to think we are part of an unhealthy attachment isn't something we're willing to even comprehend. We can't yet face the idea that we've become dependent on the same person who's hurting us. We won't be able to consider the notion that we need them to make us feel good after abuse. And during stage one, we are able to numb our real emotions. Of course, we feel hurt, pain, rejection, and all the negative things that our abuser wants us to. But we numb those emotions. We we numb the emotions we need to feel in order to listen to our gut instincts. This only accentuates the denial. We genuinely believe our own rationalizations and come to trust that the abuse can't nearly be as bad as, as it looks. Yeah. Um, that leads to internalizing the blame and rationalizing that if I hadn't done this, then maybe they wouldn't have gotten so angry at me. Had I not said that, that maybe every single time that, um, any of our fights escalated to being physical, I was drinking, which means that I was saying things meaner than I meant them (laughs) or, um, and I also went, yes. And I also went through his phone multiple times. Yep. He caught me like two of those times. Yep. And. Th- like shoved me really hard and that yeah. would start it because then I would fight back. I'd be like, oh, let's fucking go. It was yep. like, ding, 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 let's go. Um, And again, I didn't want it to happen, but I just was more ballsy when I was drinking. Yeah. Drunk me was at that point not a good person, be- probably because I was drinking to escape what was happening. And so I was yep. drinking too much. And so it just, it took a long time for me to realize that no matter what I did, I didn't deserve what was happening to me. And that he was doing it when we weren't drinking. That was just the physical stuff. Yeah. Um, Until you're able to admit that there is a problem, you can't take the steps to change it. At this point, you're convinced that you can help them change by changing what you do and say to meet their desires. But eventually you can get to stage two. This is is, only stage two? This is the first was denial. I know. We're going to have to go faster. Okay. (laughs) Stage two is admitting your reality. Okay. 
Um, it, it this right here, if you're watching this and listening and thinking about this, that is part of the stage. So admitting that life is filled to the brim with abuse and toxicity was one of the most dip difficult steps that you can take for a while. This is her speaking. Although I was able to acknowledge the severity of what I was enduring, I was still emotionally paralyzed, genuinely feeling unable to take steps to change my fate. Your feelings will shift back and forth from realizing you are a victim of abuse to the denial and back again. Yep. You adore and crave their good side, but you start to fear their bad. I still do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I've been out of the relationship 12 years and I still do that. <laughs> same, same. And like, that's the thing. I'm worried that he'll hear this and like think bad thoughts about me. Not even that he'll reach out to me yeah. or do anything, but that he'll just be like, oh, this bitch. And I know that people are like, if it's been so long and you've and you're happily married and you have children and you've been in a healthy relationship for so long, why do you care? Because when you feel crazy and you feel like you made everything up or you over dramatize things, those negative thought processes, those distorted experiences bleed into everything else. Yep. So like the water's been, po the well has been poisoned. Yep. And because I never took the time to heal from it or acknowledge it or uh, process it, I am now living in a distorted reality mm -hmm. of trying to f figure out I'm not healed. Yeah. I, I put a Band-Aid over a bullet hole yep. and I never processed what those moments did to me mm -hmm. and how they In changed the me. Yeah. Um, and so I, it's a, it's my trauma. It's a part yep. of my life experience and it will live with me. And I do need, I can't let go of it because it changed me. Right. Exactly. Um, at this stage, the fears of leaving outweigh the risks of staying in the relationship. But still, there's a big gap between the often highly exaggerated memories of the good times and the all too painful reality reality of how toxic the relationship is. Um, I'm sorry. I have to go back to that. I've given myself so much fucking grief for not moving on. Yeah. I mean, I've moved on, obviously, romantically, but like not allowing myself to stop talking about it or yeah. stop reliving different moments. But like... If I got into a car crash 10 years say, ago. This is trauma that I, I will stick forever. Yes. And, and that's and okay. I, I felt insane for that. So yeah. I don't know if anyone else has experienced that, but I just, that was a, a, a realization that I had just now and that I've never spoken about now how I'm, embarrassed I am that I've talked about it and yeah. how much guilt and grief and I mean, yeah, embarrassment that I, uh, a shame that I've carried with it just that I ever even bring up my ex right because it's like move on oh my god you crazy person we only but like right but again you were a car crash in my fucking life yes it was something so, traumatic that not only was traumatic in that moment but altered my life and my state of being forever yeah so I don't blame you and I'll yeah think about it all the time but it made me I think it altered me in a good way I don't want <laughs> happened to anybody else yeah but for me i learned good lessons out of it okay so stage three um happens after you finally accept it and this is preparing to leave this stage is super important obviously um and can take a, a while to you know have to for me it took months yeah and I had to do it really carefully because i didn't want him to know that i was preparing to leave because i didn't want him to know it involved, for me, I didn't like it because it involved a lot of lying, which it was important for my safety. Yeah. But I don't like to lie like that. And so mm -hmm. I had to lie to him constantly yeah. about certain things so he didn't find out where I which was Which is going ironic because you were already him. lying to so many people. Yes. But to him, he was my person. Yeah. You know? And I felt like, I can't lie to you. I can't deceive you. Yeah. I'm trying to show you what a good human looks like. And now yeah. here I'm being you. Yes. I can't be you to you if yeah. I want you to stop being you. Yes. <laughs> so, ugh. Um, stage four is leaving. This is without a shadow of a doubt the biggest step to take. It's the emotion emotional culmination of having to challenge your inner fears over your future, your crippling doubts that things aren't as bad as they appear to be, staring down the uncertainty and insecurity as to whether you are making the right decision. Um, leaving is fucking scary because you're going into, you're leaving comfortability, first mm -hmm. of all. You're leaving... Even though you're not in a sense of security, you do kind of have a sense of security that you're appeasing this person so they won't hurt you. That and like when this is your person, your partner, yeah. you 
even though we've talked about how you may not necessarily um, know what your future plans are, you do romanticize a life when they are finally better. Yes. And you plan, okay, what's our home going to look like? What are our ch- I had named my children. Yes. I knew where we were going to live and I pictured vacations. And mm-hmm. like we talked about those things because in a way, talking about the future in that way kind of keeps you close yes. because it's like I've already locked you in for five more years yeah, you know in your mind <laughs> yep and so you also now have to mourn mm-hmm. a life that you thought you were gonna have now there's so much fucking uncertainty obviously financial <laughs> but like who am I yeah. outside of this person they've already made you a shell that's exactly it it's who am I without them you you've developed this dependence around them and not to mention they're you're allowed to grieve and I felt like I couldn't because I was like so many people were like yay celebrate don't be sad why are you sad Mm -hmm. that was the one thing that Corey didn't understand was he could not understand there would be days where I would just bawl my eyes out Mm -hmm. and he was like why are you sad about this person this piece this is he's a piece of shit like we don't need to anything to do with him block his number let's get on with it you don't need to mourn him and it was like you but you weren't there. Yeah. Like you didn't see the good parts. You don't know what all we went through. That and I'm mourning how much of my life that I lost yes. because of this person. And how much of me I lost. Right. I felt like I was never going to get that back. And I'm glad that I did. And but- there also, this might be weird, but there may have been parts of you that you liked. Well, he that did. That can't exist outside that relationship either. There was. There was hobbies that I did together that like I try I have tried to do outside of them and they remind me so much of him that I just can't. Right. I I take no joy in it anymore. Right. It breaks my heart cuz I was freaking good at it yeah. and it was a creative outlet but I just can't even I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. So Lauren says when I first got to this stage, I couldn't eat. I barely slept. I was in a state of constant anxiety the entire time. Knowing what I needed to do, but being uncertain I could pull it off almost ruined me. Excuse me. These are normal things to feel. Um, often it takes another horrific incident following a quiet time. Um, and usually another false promise that it'll never, ever happen again. But then the abuse escalates. And this final time is what snaps you into finally leaving. Um, then stage five, last stage is maintaining your strength because again, it's easy to fall back into it. Yep. In that first year, I don't want to tell people like you leave and then fucking birds fly and doves in the air and your life is suddenly better. Holy shit. Those first like two years are so hard. The first year, especially, but then the second year you have to, you have to start healing. And sometimes it's hard to look at your life and be like, well, I have to fix this. And I can't imagine either having children, children? I that was uh that I, was something that he threatened me he and te- he told me he was going to try to get me pregnant so that i could never leave him oh, like when same he thing. That's when he put I that in writing ID. i was like oh fuck that's terrifying yep. like i loved him and i wanted to be with him and i would tell everyone else th- that's the funny thing is like you you say things to yourself in the dark that are like um, this is a red flag. This is not okay. Yep. I'm scared in my gut. Yep. You tell everyone else like, oh my God, I, I've named our children. I yep. can't wait to have a family. But as soon as he says he'll get you pregnant and you go, fuck, fuck. that's terrifying. Yep. That's a bad thing. That's <laughs> like, a very bad listen thing. Listen to that. But I can't imagine trying to get out um, or actually getting out and then having to figure out co-parenting like do you have to do that like what there's like legalities around that like that's yeah scary i want to pause just for a quick second um and say that i'm going to bring it back to this is why what's happening in texas is so fucking terrifying yes because of what you just said because of situations like that where women are trapped and then have to co-parent with an abuser Mm -hmm. for the rest of their lives over something they didn't want to happen to them absolutely fucking terrible and if you needed any more reason why that's a disgusting law there you fucking have it but she in this book so i highly recommend again did you hear that i think that they did petition um that it's unconstitutional i think the supreme court is or the judicial someone is i fuck me yeah you guys know yeah yeah (laughs) you look it up a real person said this yes a real person with real power said it and you know that i 
have inattentive ADHD. So, <laughs> so after, I don't know names or people or what yeah. actually was said, but I, I just know, know it was that something. they're going after Texas for saying that this is unconstitutional. Good. Because it is. As they fucking should. If you if you are in a situation with children, again, highly recommend the person she's talking about, her abuser, is a, the father of her children mm. and was married to her. So if you have those thoughts and you're at the point where you're like, I don't know what I'm gonna do, she has multiple books like this. Um, so Please look her up if mm-hmm. you're thinking, how can I maintain my strength? Get these and read them. They're quick reads. I read it in a day. Yeah. Um, she says, and I quote, I got there. It was one of the toughest things I have ever done in my life. It took me a long time to understand why I was even remotely attracted to the type of person who would hurt me the way he did. I found a lot of self-hatred when questioning why I stayed with him when others wouldn't have. I had some trouble building my self-esteem to a point where I was able to maintain healthy boundaries in all aspects of my life, but I got there. So that's an important part. It, this stage is hard. It's difficult. It's also the most empowering thing that I've ever felt. Calling myself a survivor and knowing what I went through and that I came out a better person on the other side is incredible. Do I feel shame still? Yes. Do I feel guilt? Yes. Am I still healing? Yes. But I am grateful that I went through it and became the person that I am because of it. And you should. Thank you. And you should. I'm trying. Yeah. (laughs) You're getting I, there. Girl. I always compare our journeys and I'm like I know what happened to you and I f- I feel like I can't even claim it because you you're I know I can't. I know it's not a competition. No, We're I not know. having yeah, like yeah. an abuse off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, but I just think what happened to you was so so fucking bad Mm -hmm. that i don't even want to put myself in in a in that category because what you did and the strength that it took for you to get out of that situation um especially being a single mom and uh, like i have so much respect for you and i'm so proud of you and you should be very proud of yourself and even though no criticizes your parenting <laughs> decisions, uh, I think I think that he, uh, if he ever finds out about this, he is going to be so proud of you and so grateful for everything oh, that you did for you. him. Well, um, thank you. So, well, <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> just do it quick. Oh. <laughs> I know I had to like. Suck them back in. <laughs> You're so much better at that than I am because my face just takes on the shape and I'm like, it's coming out, isn't it? Well, here's the thing, too. I think I'm all dried up. Mm. I've been watching a lot of 9-11 documentaries. Why? Well, I sometimes I told you I need to cry, so I yeah. watch really sad things. And also, like, I feel like we didn't learn enough about it. Like, yeah. we were so young and then they were just like, we're not going to talk about it anymore. I was just talking to Megan about that the other day, how, like, it happened and then everyone was just like, go on with your life. And I think... Nobody that sat us down and, like, explained what the fuck we had just seen. Or that was not, like, normal. Yeah. And, I, and we said that I think that's why we're constantly hyper aware that bad shit could happen because we how many times have we seen just bad shit out of the blue happen and no one told us that that wasn't normal <laughs> or like that it would get better yeah because it kind of didn't did, they're basically just didn't. like check your six yeah all the, all time. the time seriously <laughs> oh okay so pulling yourself out of the top the trauma bond <laughs> <laughs> it's really late the trauma bond Okay, so first of all, I hope this is the first step. If you're watching this, if you're reading this, if you're getting, you know, looking things up, that's the first step for you. Acknowledging that you're in it is yep. number fucking one. So you're doing great, honey. You're please doing great. Going. Amazing, sweetie. Yes. Please, please. Like how I just keep telling myself I'm not allowed to claim it because I keep comparing myself to Sierra. Like, don't do that. Yes. Claim it. Yes. I want. That's why I wanted to say to you, too. That's why I want to tell people because I was the same way. I was like, well, I'm not getting sent to the hospital until I was. Yeah. And that's why I let it go on so long because I kept making excuses like, yeah, he cheats on me every fucking day. But yeah. like, but is it really that bad? Mm hmm. And then it was like, well, yeah, he threw the thing in my face. But, like, that was an accident. But, he didn't but, mean it. But, yeah, we need to stop invalidating our experiences because all it does is prevent us from our healing. Yes. You know? A hundred percent. 
Um, okay, so she she encourages people to write down their quote unquote cycle. And for example, here's her cycle. It was anticipation, some kind of affection, momentary bliss, abuse, confusion after the abuse, the departure of the abuser or yourself from the abuser, mm -hmm. longing, utter despair, and then back to anticipation, some kind of affection. Yep. And so she encourages you to write down your cycle. That that was just hers, and it kind of was close to mine. But um, yours could be anything. Writing and the cycle can, and I I'm assuming, because I'm comparing it a lot to my experience Please. in teaching, is the timeline of this could change. Yes. Like I w some of my students, uh, especially on the autism spectrum, they would have repetitive behaviors and there was a cycle. You could see these things happening uh -huh. and there would be certain triggers that would start this spiral, but sometimes it would be a week before the next behavior. Yes. Sometimes it would be five in a day. Well, like, like I said, my last depends. time, that momentary bliss lasted for nine months. Right. And that was the longest time. That's when I was like, oh, my God, he's healed. Mm -hmm. It happened. And then the abuse that occurred after that was the biggest one that I ever had. Yeah. Like to the point where I thought I was going to die. And sorry, every time you say no, that. No, I'm I, sorry. No, you don't have to apologize <laughs> for it. I just I know I could I know you're going to see it happen yeah. because I told you I can't stop it from shooting out of my face. And so I just wanted to, like, yeah. collect myself. Sorry, I'm feeling she's moving to it. I'm like, it's OK. <laughs> Um, I also want you to write down what you feel is being fulfilled in your relationship, sense of having a family, feeling wanted, feeling secured, and then notice that you're only being temporarily fulfilled in those regions. Um, the rest of the time you're full of uncertainty, angst, pain, and sadness. That was really important for me. I had to realize that that love bombing wouldn't last as long as it did. And even if like those nine months, there were still moments where he showed his true self in there. And I, I writing that down, keeping a journal of that mm -hmm. was really, really um, important. Also determine your obsessive thoughts. So when I say like, okay, she says, for example, I was obsessed with preventing another cheating episode. Mm. I was obsessed with making my abuser the person they were when we met. I would obsess over our first few months together as it felt perfect. I'd obsess over the time he punched me and left me locked in the house alone for two days. This is her story. I'd obsess over the time it took him in the bathroom for fear that he was calling another woman when he was in there. Remember when I told you this was in the beginning. So this was when I was a different person two years ago. I told you that I didn't like when Corey slept downstairs, when he would fall asleep downstairs. And the reason why was because my ex would do this. He would, quote unquote, get drunk and pass out downstairs. But really, the reason why he was doing it was because he was texting another girl all night. He didn't want to come up to bed because he didn't want me to know that he was awake. Right. So he would pretend to be asleep and I'd go upstairs. And then when I would come down, I'd see that he had like multiple messages on his phone. I went through his phone calls. I was obsessed with going through my yep. ex's phone. I don't do that anymore and it's like such a free yeah. feeling because I know I don't have to because mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God, he is, look, I think I'm the first time I went through his phone, which I've told him I did. Yeah. I think I told you, I was like, it was so fucking boring. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's like, annoying. It is annoying. I'm like, you I start find something. <laughs> I did one time and instead of looking for like a girl, I was looking through texts with his family to be like, so when you talk shit. <laughs> I did the same thing. I was like, I gotta find something. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Me either. I got nothing. It was all just really nice things. And I was I like, know. this is disgusting. <laughs> but that's. I had to realize, now I don't care. Actually, it's wonderful. I'm, sometimes when Corey gets drunk, I'm like, I hope you fall asleep downstairs because I want the bed all the way. <laughs> so, I don't get it that much because he doesn't gross. work midnight. <laughs> it's called yeah. healing. And I know he's not doing anything down yeah. there. Like, I can trust him 100%. I've said this before. If he went to a bar and there was a super drunk girl there and she needed a ride home, there's nobody else in that bar I'd trust more to give her a ride home than my fiance. Yeah. 100%. He is that kind of person. And I know that he would never do anything like that to me and just right. I would trust him anyways. Not to do that with the drunk girl anyways. Right. Um, she says, and I highlighted this because I think it's very important. I want to remind you that you're in love with what you wish the other person was. You're not in love with who your partner is. You're in love with an idea, a memory, a fantasy, but it's not real. Yep. So anytime you're making those excuses, remember that, please. Mm hmm. She says, I would often deny my real feelings because I didn't want to accept that I was in a toxic relationship because, but also because I found it too difficult to admit that I was still in that relationship because I chose to believe in alternate reality. Well, and that's the thing that gets people because 
you believe that you get this special part of them that no one else understands and they understand you in a way that no one else understands. Yes. And that's, it's not it's real. It's special because it's not of that. Real. But yeah, it's Because not guess real. what? He they gave d- that part of himself to everybody, I found out. Everyone that he needed something from. Yep. But anyone who he doesn't need something from. Yep. Um, or she, I, I know we keep saying he, but that's just it's because just, of our experience. Yeah. Um, they, whoever this person is. So, the reason that the people who they're trying to isolate you from mm-hmm. see this version of them that you think is, no, you just don't know him like I do. No, they know him like who he is, the person that he doesn't create because he doesn't need something from them. Exactly. They don't, he's not filtering himself yes. or creating a character for these people because he doesn't need to. Exactly. Because he doesn't. He's not trying to sleep with them. He's not trying to live with them. He's not Win trying them over to in get some money. Way so he that- stole money from me and my dad. Like, Oh, I got money stolen from me multiple times. By Honestly, I don't know which person that I'm using. <laughs> it could have been one of two. And how fucked up is that? That I don't know which one it was. <laughs> So. They're working together as a tag team operation. They were. They're both the same person. Yeah. That's the other thing, too. The fir- Here's what I want to say. I left the first time. And then <laughs> ended up with ended up with someone worse. And so I was like, well, fuck, I might as well go back to the other one. I left because multiple it seems times. like everyone's like that. Then. Yes. And I left multiple times and found other people yeah. and had like temporary flings with them. But every time that it didn't work out, he was always there. Yeah. And he was always reminding me, like, remember how good we had it in mm-hmm. the beginning? And it was always that again. And so I'd fall right back into it because yep. it was familiar. Yeah. Comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, She. Uh, highlighted this as well here's probably the most difficult thing you're going to hear to heal you have to abstain from your addiction to recover means that to abstain completely this means zero contact at all this is the only way you can break the bond you have to detach you need to prize yourself away from an unfulfilling emotional entanglement of the relationship again i went to these other people and started relationships but he was always still in my phone He was always watching my Facebook. I never wanted, just like Mm -hmm. as a back burner, I wanted him there. And guess what? When he realized that these weren't going to work, he swooped right in every single time. The only reason that it worked as well as it did was because I moved to a different city when I left the final Mm -hmm. time. I blocked him on literally everything. I changed my phone number. Yep. Um, I changed jobs. Yep. Like, I had to get away from everywhere, and that sucked. For me, that was so hard, but worth it. Yes, my entire life was upended. Yes, it was a struggle for a year. But in the long run, it was the best fucking thing I ever did. Yeah. And that job sucked anyway. <laughs> I wanted away from it. Um, in order to break an addiction, you need to understand that you are battling chemical responses. So this Which is, is helpful. I hope that's validating for please, someone. Please, yes. This does mean that by severing the relationship, you will not feel very good for a while. Much like with any addict, you're going to feel withdrawal symptoms. You're going to not, like like I said, it's not going to be all, oh, I did it, yay, now let's hang out and party or whatever, have a good time, celebrate for the next year. I had ups and downs, that whole, like, terrible, terrible grief, bouts of crying. It was just like the hardest year that I've gone through. Right. And we talked about in our grief episode that you don't move through the stages. No. You bounce back and forth between them all the time. The duration that it takes while you're in different stages varies. Um, And you never arrive at completely healed. You will go forever. Yeah. Um, Rest assured, just like with any other addiction, if you can refuse to respond to your brain chemistry, you will get through these incredibly tough times and your brain will eventually come to rest at a state of balance and calmness. Mm -hmm. It does happen. Here's a couple suggestions. They're very quick. And then that'll be it. Number one, find a positive distraction in that first time of getting away. Um, Find something that you love to do that you lost. So any kind of hobby, reading, writing um painting meditating, painting doing anything for like just you running yeah like anything that you gave up in those years that you were trying to survive find that love for that again mm-hmm. and really just throw yourself into it try to distract yourself because those thoughts are going those obsessive thoughts are going to stay for a while but eventually they they get quiet 
Two, try to connect with someone healthy, whether that's someone from your previous life, as we did again, big time. Am I someone healthy? Yeah. Hello. Fun. If I went back to him, you would kick my fucking ass. Oh, yeah. And I needed to know that. And (laughs) no, nothing helps you escape toxicity (laughs) like a physical threat. I mean, like kicking my ass metaphorically. (laughs) With love. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, and Corey was my someone healthy as well. But mm-hmm. like I said, I, it was sad because I was I was being the toxic one to him. Um, Write everything down in a journal. This is for some people. Feel, like, I'm not a journal person, but if you like to, it really does help. This is kind of our journal. Uh, yes. So and I was going to say this, too, Um, that journaling has helped. But I... When I was still doing my family YouTube channel, I had intended to make a video talking about therapy. Mm -hmm. And I recorded videos of myself right before I would start a therapy session because I wanted people to see what it looks like before a therapy session and what What it looks looks like like after. after. And then what it looks like after a week, a month of therapy. When I look at the first video of myself... I was, I want to hug that girl. I feel so sad for her because she was very fidgety. She's shaking. She is, um, she looks sick. Yeah. Uh, And she's so scared. I, I feel so sad that like I was in that place where I was so scared to even talk about my trauma with someone, a trusted professional. Right. I was terrified. And then immediately after there's a video of me where I, I'm visibly lighter. Like yeah. you can tell that even though that first session was just me getting to know Barbara, um, it was intimidating. Yes. Scary. And that's, I think helpful in this situation as well, because I can look back at that girl and I, Yes, I feel sad for her, but I also feel very proud yes. that she took that step and I feel proud of myself for the growth that I've made. Yeah. It's hard it's hard to uh, measure your growth when you have no benchmarks, yeah. when you have nothing to look back on. Um, it's almost like taking photos if you are on like a weight loss journey or if, like a fitness journey. It, when you take those progress photos, it's easy. It's harder when it's mental. Yes. You know, it's harder when it's an emotional growth. It, yeah. How do you document that? How right. do you check in on that? Right. And so that can be super helpful, but really getting it out in any way. Yep. I remember taking pictures for me. It was a big thing. I just put one side by side of what it was the last time that I was hurt where I had like physical bruises, but also just the light in my eyes was yep. gone. And then I took a picture recently and I was just like, it, it literally looks like I'm glowing, not just because yep. I'm pregnant. But like yeah. it literally like I got my spark back, mm-hmm. I feel, and I lost it for so many years. Yeah. So I hope. I hope this helped somebody. Yeah. Um, please. There are so many more resources. Like I, I just wanted to explain this to you guys and it ended up going way longer, but I'm glad that it did. Yeah. Um, but please, there's, I'm sure we'll put up some resources for if you're in a domestic, yeah. uh, you know, relationship. So take those if you need them. Um, these books, there's so many like this. Like I, when I was getting out, the easiest thing for me before I left for sure was reading things like this, looking up things like this. I said I liked it because I like true crime and I like psychology and yeah. things like that, which I do. But at the same time, I was like, I wanted to understand what was happening inside yep. of me and inside of him and why I wasn't crazy for yeah doing it. So, so I hope it helped. Yes. And we hope you guys were able to validate yourself with this and that you are able to work towards healing and feel less alone. And yes. we love you so much. Yes. Um, that's the, that on trauma bonding yeah. and healing and love bombing and all the, all the stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all the stuff. Thank you guys so much. Um, we will see you next week. All right. We're out. Goodbye. <laughs>